Thanks very much. And uh, ah, amazing. So first off, I want to thank uh, the organizers warmly, not just for inviting me, but also for making this uh, an enjoyable conference also remotely, which is what I had to do until this morning due to illness. I'm fine now. But um, um, yes, it, it was really, um, yeah, well, well done. Um, so what I'm going to do today <laughs> no, non funziona. <laughs> okay. Is to, uh, sì, sì. Is to defend a thesis about the proper aesthetic appreciation of uh, nature in the context of design. So by drawing on instances of design that incorporate natural elements. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on instances of design uh, that are drawn from the realm of fashion design. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the work of Alexander McQueen and the uh, fashion design items I have in mind are things such as this uh, bodice that includes quartz elements or this one that includes muscle shells. Um, and the question will be, what is the proper way to aesthetically appreciate nature as incorporated as in these instances of design? So first off, I'm going to make some uh, clarifications about the terms that I'm using. What do I mean by aesthetic appreciation? Long, but I think helpful quote by Malcolm Budd. Uh, by aesthetic appreciation, I mean a response that's aesthetic insofar as the response is directed at the experience properties of an item, the nature and arrangement of its elements or the interrelationships among its parts or aspects, and which involves a felt positive or negative reaction to the item considered in itself. So that what governs the response is whether the object is intrinsically rewarding or displeasing to experience in itself. Um, and many different things can be aesthetically appreciated in the sense, uh, sport, juggling, circus acts, furniture, clothes, wine, motor cars, machines, and tools of all kinds, and much else. Um, now, by the aesthetic appreciation of nature, I will mean simply aesthetic appreciation that has nature as its object. Um, now, the case of design incorporating natural elements may initially not seem, you know, the best case for discussing the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature, because after all, it's nature removed from its typical setting. But here I'm going to draw on Malcolm Budd again. This was a suggestion by uh, Jennifer Welchman, who commented on this paper uh, at, at some point, who drew me to this quote that says, at a zoo, you cannot appreciate an animal in its natural environment, but it does not follow that your appreciation must be of a caged animal, uh, an animal as caged. Rather, you can ignore its surroundings and appreciate the animal itself. And I claim that this is the same for these design items because you can still appreciate like the, the quartz or the muscle shells, even though they are inserted in uh, uh, these, these items of design. So now what does it mean to properly uh, aesthetically appreciate nature. And here I'm going to sort of explore different views of what this means, ranging from less demanding, what Zangwill seems to have in mind, which is roughly something like enjoying the beauty of nature, being open to as much beauty as nature can offer, to what I think is a more demanding notion of proper aesthetic appreciation, which is not falling prey to either aesthetic deceptions or aesthetic omissions. I will come back to these ideas in uh, due course. So how do we achieve a proper aesthetic appreciation of nature? Again, the debate is roughly divided among the following camps. First, anti-formalism or cognitivism, according to which a certain kind of knowledge is necessary for the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature. That's why it's called cognitivism. And not just awareness of formal properties, such as colors or shapes. That's why it's also called anti-formalism. Uh, and in any case, even if uh, cognitivism contemplates the like formal properties as, as relevant to aesthetic appreciation, this is only insofar as they are veridical. This is going to be important later. Now, what knowledge? This ranges from knowledge of natural kinds, tiger, horse, mammal, to more sophisticated kinds of, for example, scientific knowledge. Um, knowledge of natural kinds is what I'm going to be concerned with in this talk. For example, some people say that in order to properly aesthetically appreciate the gracefulness of a whale, we need to know that it's a mammal rather than a fish. Um, on the other side, we find formalism or cognitivism, according to which to properly aesthetically appreciate nature, it is enough to be aware of its formal properties, such as colors and shapes. That's why it's called formalism. 
And also related in knowledge is not necessary. That's why it goes by the name of anti-cognitivism. Okay, so enough ground clearing. What I'm going to do today is to first um, present this view by Zangwill, which is a version of extreme formalism about inorganic nature specifically. And I will show prima facie support for it as, as a view that looks like it could do for the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature in design. Then I will present a case against extreme formalism by um, sort of arguing that knowledge is necessary in two senses to properly aesthetically appreciate nature and design. First, we will need knowledge of the contrast between appearance and reality, whereby reality I mean natural kinds. And secondly, knowledge of naturalness, which kind, which kind of falls out of uh, knowledge of natural kinds. And if time allows, I will explore some ethical implications of the view that I'm going to defend. A view which is in search of a name, incidentally. I will um, uh, go to this later. So let me start with Zangwill's uh, extreme formalism. So he puts forward an extreme version of formalism, arguing that properly aesthetically appreciating inorganic nature, which he describes just, you know, uh, but in terms of examples, rocks, lakes, clouds, it is enough to be aware of its bare appearance. Uh, which I'm going to define in a second. We needn't and shouldn't know its reality or deeper nature. What he means by their appearances is appearances that survive despite our knowledge that reality is different. Uh, a, a famous case is uh, the Muller-Lear illusion. Uh, even if we know that the lines are of the same length, this will not, you know, the, the, their appearance as of being of different lengths will survive. Um, this bit of knowledge. So this is what's meant by their appearances. And according to Zangwill, um, when we want to properly aesthetically appreciate clouds, this is his main uh, case study, only appearances matter. Why? Because the bare appearances of clouds is as of solid, soft, and springy. We know that in reality, clouds are none of these things, but this knowledge will make the bare appearance of clouds as soft, solid, and springy go away. And according to him, that's a basis for our proper aesthetic appreciation of them. To enjoy the beauty of clouds, which according to him amounts to properly aesthetically appreciating them, we only need to be aware of their bare appearance. And this is based on what Zangwill takes to be an observation. Our enjoyment of the beauty of clouds will not increase. If anything, it will be ruined if we draw on knowledge of the clouds' real properties. Um, so he says, we need not judge that things have their aesthetic properties in virtue of their natural kinds, and we should not judge that things have their aesthetic properties in virtue of their natural kinds. This yield extreme formalism about inorganic nature. For reasons I will not go into, he does not hold the same view about organic nature. Um, and uh, to, 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 to further Bartrus's case, he says, Scientific knowledge about inorganic nature will at best satisfy our curiosity, uh, but it will not open up more beauty. So on this view, aesthetic judgments about inorganic things should always ignore their natural kinds and should only take their appearances into account. Okay, so how plausible is this? Um, so interestingly, I find that design that incorporates natural elements, both inorganic and organic, lends prima facie plausibility to Zangwill's thesis. Um, for both inorganic and organic nature. Why? Well, here is an example of design that incorporates natural elements are both organic pearls and inorganic stones of various kinds. Um, so, and it seems to me that at least prima facie, we could say, you know, everything that we need in order to appreciate its beauty is just an appreciation of the formal properties of all these natural elements, the colors, the reflectance properties, all these things. And um, and this is why I'm saying that prima facie, it seems like this is going to do justice to the proper aesthetic appreciation of inorganic nature, again, quartz on this bodice, or organic nature, the, the muscle shells. Initially, it seems that it, it might seem plausible. And now I'm going to present another case study, which I think, again, lends prima facie plausibility to Zangwill's thesis, emphasis on the prima facie, this is a necklace, again, designed by Alexander McQueen and executed by Sean Lean. Um, you can see that the necklace is made of two different parts, an upper part, about which I will say more later, and, and, and a lower part that is made um, of strands of pearls. I will 
blow up the image in, in, in a moment. And again, it seems that what makes it beautiful is just an appreciation of colors, shapes, you know, this, this curious arrangement. Fine. Now, if we focus on the necklace and look at it more closely, we will see gradually that the upper part, which from afar looked like it might have been made of something very light and fluffy, um, is actually made of lacquered pheasant claws. Um, I mean, you, you won't, you, you can see the claws more about the fact that these are real pheasant claws that have been lacquered. Um, so you might think that in order to enjoy the beauty of McQueen's necklace, it would be best if our appreciation stopped at appearances and did not go beyond them. And if we did not, did not know that the necklace is partly made of lacquered pheasant claws. This is why I'm saying it's prima facie support for Zangwill's thesis. Um, and, and this is why I'm saying that it is initially plausible for nature, inorganic and organic alike. But is that right? Does it stand up to scrutiny? And what I'm going to say is that ultimately it does not. So now I'm going to make a case against extreme formalism um, by sort of arguing that knowledge of the contrast between appearance and reality is actually needed to properly aesthetically appreciate something like this necklace. Um, so what I said earlier is that, you know, it might seem at first like we, we, we can more properly aesthetically appreciate this necklace if we do not know that it's partly made of lacquered pheasant claws. But the uh, first response that we might have to that is, would we really find the necklace more beautiful if we stopped at appearances? This partly turns on what is beautiful. Small question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and so, um, and this is something that it, there will be various stages in this talk where I'm going to draw on help from the audience. So one question is, is this beautiful? Okay, there is a sense in which this is genius, highly artistically valuable and everything, but is it beautiful? You know, there, there's a sense in which it's ugly, obviously. I mean, I can't, you know, take my eyes off it. I think it's genius. I think it's highly artistically valuable. But there, I think there is a, and if not, tell me because I'd be curious to know, but I think that there is a mood point about whether we can describe this as beautiful rather than something else, ugly, disturbing, whatever. Um, whatever we answer about this painting, whether it's beautiful or not, I think we should say the same about McQueen's necklace, asking ourselves whether it's beautiful or not. Um, if we think that um, uh, Bacon's painting is beautiful, and if we think that relatedly McQueen's necklace is beautiful even once we take into account the fact that it's partly made of pheasant claws. If so, knowledge that goes beyond appearances does open up more beauty. So it does enable the more proper aesthetic appreciation of it. Um, if on the other hand, because here I'm just going to uh, go with a conditional claim, if on the other hand we think that this necklace is ultimately not beautiful but rather ugly, grotesque and whatever, still this necklace has aesthetic properties that are better appreciated through knowledge of natural kinds. So here we, we would need to change our view of what it means to properly aesthetically appreciate nature. If we think that it's just about appreciating the highest number of aesthetically relevant properties, still going beyond appearances will enable us to do that. Um, moreover, by stopping at appearances, we would fail to fully aesthetically appreciate the complexity of McQueen's design. So here I'm going to draw on um, material from the Victorian Albert Museum that hosted uh, an exhibition about Alexander McQueen's work. Um, it's and, and what I found about it is this necklace made for a collection that had a strong Gothic undercurrent, juxtaposes beauty and the grotesque with its intriguing combination of organic materials, expensive Tahitian pearls and lacquered pheasant claws. In this instance, the long strands of pearls echo the drapery of the 1920s flapper style gowns in the collection, while the inclusion of pheasant claws allude to a darker aesthetic. Although on the surface, the claws appear hard and vulgar, from a distance they resemble fur. And that's partly what makes this bit of design clever, this contrast between this delicate appearance and the reality which is much harsher and vulgar. So contrast angle, the proper aesthetic appreciation of this instance of design, I think requires both awareness of these delicate and, and illusory appearances and knowledge of natural kinds, which in this case are pheasant claws, because McQueen's design and more generally, the theme underlying the collection relies on this contrast. So let us grant for the sake of argument that 
going beyond appearances with this necklace could lead to a less pleasant aesthetic experience, which I'm not, I'm not sure that it does, but, but let's suppose that for the sake of argument. What I would like to point out now is that going beyond appearances does not always entail having a less pleasant aesthetic experience. So let us turn now to this other instance of fashion design. This is now Maria Grazia Curie for uh, Dior. And this gown, I promise there are no <laughs> unpleasant surprises here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, like looking at, it, looking at it from afar, there are no illusory appearances here, but there are appearances that are not extremely informative. You just see a pattern, of, a beautiful pattern of that, of colors. And um, I'm going to show you how we can get more knowledge that's um, going to open up more beauty. First of all, it's interesting to know that the pattern is inspired by a Van Gogh painting, and that's what it's supposed to reproduce which I think already makes will make our enjoyment of this gown sort of greater. But also, if we look at it more closely, we will see that these patches of colors are obtained by small feathers that have been stitched on the dress, which is a very pleasant surprise. And again, it, it increases both our, the pleasantness of our experiences in, in looking at this, and, um, and it's also pleasantly surprising, because even though unlike pheasant claws, feathers are not unlikely elements of fashion design. Still, this is a surprising way of employing them. So uh, this is another case to, to say that there is something to be gained, definitely going beyond appearances in the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature in design. And while the case of McQueen's necklace might be a bit controversial, in, in this case, we can, uh, I think, more readily see what there is to be gained from um, a greater, but from having our aesthetic appreciation informed by knowledge. Okay, so entering conclusion, contra extreme formalism, I believe that the proper aesthetic appreciation of these instances of design that incorporate natural elements should involve both awareness of appearances and knowledge of natural kinds. And this is the point in which I say that it's, it's a view in search for a name. Because in previous versions of this talk, I said that what I was defending was a version of cognitivism insofar as I am uh, invoking the necessity for a certain kind of knowledge to inform our uh, um, aesthetic appreciation. But actually, again, by Jennifer Welchman, I, I was pointed to this view called moderate formalism that Zangwill himself describes, although he does not apply it to inorganic nature, which is a view that much of in his case, in organic things, beauty depends on their bare appearances, but also that much of their um, beauty depends on the deeper nature. Um, sorry, no, that should have been organic. N never mind. Anyway, so so I think that this might be a label for, for the view that I'm defending, but again, I will accept suggestions from the audience about how I should christen it. Um, yeah, because Zangwill is a moderate formalist about organic nature, so sorry about the previous slide, and human artifacts, and an extreme formalist about inorganic nature. So, but I think that this moderate formalism is the correct view for both kinds of nature, and in particular nature incorporated in design, because one thing that the incorporation in design does is to highlight the continuity between organic and inorganic nature from the point of view of aesthetic appreciation. So, one more, um, reason why I think that knowledge is important for the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature turns on the idea of naturalness and also on a different way of thinking of aesthetic appreciation that I mentioned at the outset. Uh, so far I have assumed a view of proper aesthetic appreciation whereby this involves more beauty being opened up, but now I want to switch to a different conception of proper aesthetic appreciation that uh, is inspired by Carlson, who presented this case. So thinks of a natural coastline versus a man-made one, which he calls, um, which is indistinguishable from the natural one. And he says, if, if for example, we perceive M, the man-made coastline, in the category of natural coastlines, what it appears to be, we will become involved in one or both of the following. Failure to appreciate it under descriptions such as being carefully designed by man, and appreciation of it under descriptions which are false of it, such as it's being the result of the sea's erosion. The first alternative is undesirable, as it constitutes a case of aesthetic omission, and the second is undesirable, as it constitutes a case of aesthetic deception. And so we can think of proper aesthetic appreciation now in more demanding terms, not so much as one that will allow us to uh, appreciate more beauty, but rather as an aesthetic appreciation that enables us to avoid aesthetic deceptions and aesthetic omissions. 
Now, if we think of proper aesthetic appreciation in this way, all the more it becomes important to know the nature of uh, the components of McQueen's necklace, because, and in particular, we need to be aware of the realness or naturalness of some of its components, because, you know, for example, we could appreciate this necklace by just noticing that the items in the upper part resemble pheasant claws. Um, but actually, we, we need to know that they are made of real pheasant claws rather than items that merely look like them. Why? Because, for example, if we thought that the necklace was made of items that merely resemble pheasant claws but are entirely made of metal, say, we would be under an aesthetic deception because we would mistakenly credit the goldsmith, in this case, Sean Lean, for faithfully reproducing pheasant claws, which he did not do. What, what he did was to lacquer them. Um, also, knowing the claws to be natural will result in a greater shock. And this shock, though unpleasant, seems essential for the proper aesthetic appreciation of this design item in the sense of fully appreciating one of the themes that McQueen wanted to sort of put forward with, uh, well, his work in general and that collection in particular, this contrast between beauty and the grotesque. Again, drawing on the materials from the Victorian Albert Museum website, McQueen often contrasted fashion's glamour with darkness and death. He employed the skull as a decorative device and used the varied detritus of animal parts, skeletons, wounds, and taxidermy as embellishments. So it seems central to fully appreciate in McQueen's necklace that we are aware of the realness or naturalness of the pheasant claws in order to appreciate the connection of this item with his recurrent themes of darkness and death. Um, let me now turn quickly to another example, which is that of um, uh, this muscle shell bodice. And here, like in McQueen's necklace, I think it's important to, to know that these are real muscle shells for slightly different reasons. Um, first of all, these are unlikely elements in fashion design, again, um, and they are for uh, a number of reasons. It, it's important to know that they're real because appreciating the realness brings with it a number of important unsettling associations, for example, with dirt, or if you come from, like me, from a town where the signature dishes are muscle-based food, uh, which is something really odd to then see on, on a garment. And now to draw on Filippo's work, um, so who pointed out that disgust is primarily ideational rather than sensory nature, and it's primarily elicited in virtue of the idea of a certain disgusting thing rather than of its sensory features. I think this is this is right. The fact the disgust reaction is not based on bare appearances, but on the knowledge of the natural kinds that are involved uh, in in this design item. So, and that's why to get you know, the, the full experience we need to know the natural kinds of the components of these items, partly because we need to be aware of their realness or naturalness and not just of the fact that they uh, could be something that just looks like, say, muscle shells or whatever. M moreover, uh, muscle shells, as well as other shells employed in the same collection, are known to be sharp. And so looking at garments that incorporate them also elicits a sense of danger that would not necessarily be generated by items that merely look like shells. So this is another bit in the same collection. And anecdotally, apparently one of the models wearing this got um, slightly injured <laughs> by, by getting uh, cut by one of the shells. And, and this is also important, the fact that it's these are unlikely elements in fashion design for a reason. They're not really functional. Um, so an another interesting conclusion, which is now actually approaching to the real conclusion, the proper aesthetic appreciation of these instances of design incorporating natural elements should involve knowledge of whether the apparently natural elements are actually natural as opposed to artificial. That's another like um, extent to which knowledge is important for the proper aesthetic appreciation. So hereby, I claim to have a made a case against extreme formalism. Like I said, this view is in search of a name. I think moderate formalism might be it, to the extent that I think that the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature and design requires both knowledge of natural kinds and naturalness relatedly, but also in some cases, awareness of appearances where these appearances might be illusory. Um, very, very quickly ethical implications, uh, of which I don't know very much really, but these, these are very tentative steps. So something that looks like a minor digression, Cheryl Foster provides the following interesting example. While observing a striking, brightly colored sunset, 
we might learn that these marvelous colors are the result of an air pollutant, sulfur dioxide. Um, and this knowledge would be essential, according to some at least, for the aesthetic appreciation to be tinged with the appropriate re emotional reaction. So the knowledge that I have suggested as necessary for aesthetically appreciating nature and design would lend itself to supporting analogous complex emotional reactions, depending on your sentiments for pheasants and, and so on. Um, this partly, however, I think depends uh, on knowing a bit more about the history of this item. Uh, so I've suggested that the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature and design should take into account uh, both formal and non-formal properties where the latter include natural kinds, but maybe the history of these items should also be part of the non-formal aesthetically relevant properties because um, and maybe the view that I have suggested could incorporate the history. Why? For a number of reasons. First, this would preserve the view of some versions of anti-formalism according to which our ethical and aesthetic judgments should align. And the way for them to align is to know enough about what we're observing to um, make the relevant ethical judgments. And, uh, and so it might be important for us to know the history of like where these natural items come from to have the appropriate emotional reaction. I think it would be very different if we knew that the pheasants have been slaughtered precisely for the reason of making this item as opposed to them being the byproduct of the food industry. And unfortunately about the pheasant claws, we do not know where they come from. Apparently, again, anecdotally, uh, um, McQueen turned up on Sean Lee's doorstep with a bag of pheasant claws and it's not known where they came from. We know <laughs> We know a little bit, however, about the uh, the shells. Apparently, they were sourced from Beach in Norfolk and in Billingsgate Fish Market, which maybe makes it a bit better. But, but so this was just a tentative reflection that historical properties might also be relevant and might also be part of the view of the sort of view that I am suggesting, whereby a certain kind of knowledge is necessary. Uh, and now I swear I'm done. So I started with a question as to what the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature requires, focusing on cases of nature incorporated in design. And I consider the prima facie plausibility of Zangwill's extreme formalism about inorganic nature, according to which it's enough for us to be aware of appearances. I suggested that the stance might be prima facie plausible for organic and inorganic nature alike. Um, but contra this, I argue that the proper aesthetic appreciation of design incorporating natural elements should involve both an awareness of formal properties, even when these are illusory, and knowledge of natural kinds, related in knowledge of whether the apparently natural elements are real or natural as opposed to unreal or artificial. And lastly, maybe, and very tentatively, knowledge of the history of these natural items, which might be relevant for ethical considerations, if we think that these are connected to our aesthetic judgments. And that's it. Thank you very much.